You are listening to the Higher Calling Podcast, your source for all things hiring, staffing, and recruiting. I'm Pete Newsom with Ricky Baez again today. Ricky, how are you? Pete, we should make a habit of this. We should, we should make a habit of this? We, we don't <laughs> sure. already have a habit of this? Oh, we do have a habit. You know what? First step is admitting we got a, a recording. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> I, think, I think we're there. I think we're, we're there. there. We can't hide yep. from it anymore. That's how right. are you today, Ricky? Doing good, man. Doing really good. New Should week. Be doing good. You're you're about to head to Barcelona for uh, for oh, vacation. So I cannot wait. Cannot wait. Head to Barcelona. Hop on a Royal Caribbean ship. Be there for seven days. Then uh, spend a couple of days in Barcelona. Come on back. Well, man, I am I am envious and look forward to hearing about it and hopefully see some pics while you're while you're there. Oh, you're gonna get millions of them. Watch. <laughs> Great. You're just gonna rub it in. Make That's right. You feel even worse being here grinding away. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. That's right. That, that's what I'm here for, Pete. Well, let, let's do what we can while we can to help mm -hmm. uh, anyone listening with today's topic, which is how to conduct an executive search. So let's talk about that. Are you ready? Let's do, let's let's dive in. So so the, the executive recruiting process is not altogether different than searching for any other role, but there are some unique things when because when we're we're talking about a position that is more unique. The candidate pool is not as vast. You have to approach it a little bit differently, don't you think? I would, you know, at first when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, it's the same thing because you have to identify who you're looking for. You have to do all these, all these things that resonate with the regular recruitment process. But then as, as I thought about it more and more, Pete, yes, you do have to approach it differently because if you're looking for an executive, this person is going to have a deeper, more widespread impact into the organization than somebody who's not an executive. So you do have to be more particular in who you bring on board. Yes, absolutely. So when we're talking about executive search, we're talking about senior leadership positions. And you know, there's they kind of fall into two categories. Uh, one is a new position that's being created from scratch. That happens a lot. Growing companies, times are evolving. I mean, let's just look at AI right now, right? I could see chief AI officer being a, a position that exists in the not too distant future. Can't you? Oh, absolutely. 15, 20 years ago, uh, a social media marketing specialist didn't exist. So yeah, this, this could definitely exist in the nearer future. I, I say two years. That's right. I, I was actually asked uh, uh, by a chief marketing officer about somewhere between 10 and 15 years ago to create a, I don't remember the exact title, but it was a senior leadership position that reported uh, directly to the CMO um, for digital content and social media. And this was that, 15 years ago? It, 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 it's somewhere wow. between 10 and 15 years ago. Yeah. And uh, what was interesting about that role for us as a staffing company, a recruiting firm, that we did not have, there was no job description that existed. So we had to write one from scratch. So that is the kind of thing that we get asked to do on a semi regular basis. But the point being, not all executive roles have a predecessor. Yeah. When they do, what's also highly unique about executive roles is there's often a, a big degree of confidentiality that needs to be yeah. considered. Uh, because you know, a lot of times these uh, executive searches will take place but while the person's still in the role yeah. who doesn't know they're being replaced, right? Um, or the That's organization, true. for whatever reason, may not want to communicate the message to the team if they know that a senior person is leaving, either retiring or you know, choosing to separate mutual or otherwise from the, the company. You, you may want to um, be able to announce a replacement at the same time you announce a departure. That's also very common. Correct. Yeah, it, it's um in. I really am curious about going down the creating the position route because I love, I love to talk. I love to take a deep dive into the reason why a team decides we need another executive here or we need an executive here. So some of the things we're going to talk about today, yes, how do we find, how do we conduct that executive search? But I'm really curious to find out what are some of the, uh, what are some of the uh, not robust, but indicators that would tell an organization we need an executive. We need another position in here and let's get a company like Four Corner Resources to do this for us. Yeah. I, I, well, the, look, those are the, the answers are uh, are limitless, I think, depending <laughs> depending on, on the organization. Um, but let's let's kind of back up before we get there and talk okay. about 
you know, this process and what, you know, some of the traits uh, and characteristics of it that make it different than a regular search. And one of them, of course, is the length of time and level of effort, right? So those are two. Let's, let's start with length of time. On the surface, do you think uh, it, you think it takes longer than uh, con uh, conducting a search for a staff level position? I think it would take longer and it will cost more money because if you, if you're searching for a regular staff person, I, I would venture to guess 80% of the search would happen in the local area um, and 20% would happen outside. Whereas executive search is more outside of the local area than not because you're looking for more specific niche skill set that the organization is going to need. And chances are it's going to be away from you. And so yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to cast a wide net. You know, you said 80, 20, I think it's probably more 95, you know, five oh, wow. uh, when it comes wow. to yeah. staff level roles and, yeah. and every industry and company has their own, um, you know, there's, there's unique things. We know yeah. that, but generally speaking, you're hundred percent correct. And once you get up, as you go higher up the chain, there's fewer candidates who are qualified and mm -hmm. and a good fit. So we, we I separate those because you can be qualified on paper, you can be qualified technically uh, from an experience standpoint, an education standpoint. But when you're talking about an executive role, then then you have to make sure that the qualification exists in, in terms of who the person is, the soft skills, the culture yeah. fit. That's its own challenge when when hiring an executive. But um a hundred percent in agreement that it you have to uh, plan more time. Yep. And with that comes expense. Now, now, where, where does that expense come from? Let's, let's talk through that a little bit. Well, I mean, before in the, in, in the planning phase of any type of executive search effort, yeah, there has to be a budget, right? And that budget has to include what markets are you going to advertise in and who you interview? Are you going to fly them in to meet the rest of the staff? I mean, there's a lot and you have to pay for that. You as the, as the organization, so that money has to be budgeted and it's, you need a recruitment team that really knows how to, how to be efficient in their processes that we stay in budget. Cause the last thing you want to do is tell the uh, executive leadership who's leading this, this, this initiative to say, Hey boss, we're out of budget. Can we get some more money? Nobody wants to hear that. Oh, Ricky, you're hurting my heart a little bit with that because you, you <laughs> didn't even acknowledge that uh, you know, the organization may need to hire a third party firm like, or oh. resources or, 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 or others to, to conduct that search for them. And there's, ask me again, uh, ask me again. There's, <laughs> I think we know your stance. Look, you're the HR guy. That's what, that's what you're here for uh, yeah. to, to figure out how to hire those positions internally. But in, in reality, when it comes to an executive position, we know that uh, in a, a lot of cases, it will make sense to hire a headhunter, a, a, a mm. professional recruiting firm, who operates in many cases on a retained search agreement. And we'll touch on that briefly, but the reason for, for that third party is that it is an intensive search. It does take a lot of time. And depending on the size of your HR team, you may not have the resources to expend on that because you, you're really diving into a, 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 a situation where you have to explore the industry, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 um, you have to have the right network in the industry. It's not going to be as simple as posting a job ad on indeed. That's not how executive <laughs> searches are typically <laughs> yeah. conducted. You have to uh, commit to going after it in a much more proactive way. And that's what a third party can do for a number of reasons. I mentioned the network in, in the industry knowledge and experience, but also a third party can be a lot more aggressive um, and 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 subtle, where if if confidentiality is an issue, and it often yeah. is, it's it's hard to maintain confidentiality when ABC Company is calling others to to you know to perform perform a search. You're kind of yeah. gonna know who it is yeah. if you're if you are ABC Company hiring for ABC Company, where the third party can maintain that confidentiality in a much more effective way. Did I convince you, you? Did I convince you of that? that no, no, you did. You did. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you there. It, so let me ask you this then, because I know I've done a few of these, and 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 this was for a local government, right? So for local government, um, we we had to find a fire chief. Obviously, you cannot find a, ch a fire chief in the general area that's looking for a job. So you got to go elsewhere. But 
I'm asking you directly, Pete, in your opinion, when conducting an executive search, the people or the candidates that the recruiter or the or the search team is connecting to, what percentage of them, the candidates, already have a job versus people who are looking for a job? Well, it's very high. Yeah. Right? I, I, you know, 90% plus, maybe, maybe higher. Um, I would assume that that they almost that almost all of them will. So so the skill set that the recruiting team needs to have they need to have a really, really keen salesmanship strategy to be able to talk somebody away from somewhere where they're happy at. Because here's what's going to happen. I'm, I'm venturing to guess a recruiter would reach out to executives who are currently working somewhere else yeah. to see if they have any interest. Whereas a regular staff, you put something out on LinkedIn or, or, or indeed, and people who are unhappy with their job or don't have a job, I'm going to jump on it. So it's two different skill sets. I'm assuming, right? Well, what, what you're just, you're describing the post and pray uh, approach to recruiting <laughs> yes. where yes. You, you post a job ad and, and just wait for applicants to come in and, yeah. Um, to your point, that is not uh, a, a great way to approach executive recruiting for, for many reasons. So you know, one, confidentiality is certainly out the window once, yep. once you do that. Two, you have to question who you're going to attract that way for this executive role. Because if if do you want passive candidates who are gainfully employed, not looking, thriving where they are? Ideally, yes, you do for, for an executive position. I mean, for any position, let's let's yeah. be let's be honest. But we also know that that it become it becomes a matter of practicality at uh, you know at, at some level. So you can't you, know, you recruit all your staff positions just relying on passive candidates. That's that's mm. I wouldn't recommend that to anyone. Um, but when it comes to your executives, you want to start there by default. All right. I mean, you want to go s steal, for lack of a better way to put it. That's um, the best way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> from from others. And that's another reason why a third party is often valuable in this scenario, because you don't have the same considerations for professional courtesy that mm. uh, a company in the industry, even though they're a competitor, there's certain things that you just ideally won't do. And so, you know, pillaging your your competitors' executives may be bad form in, in some industries, some it's not, where they truly are. You know, true enemies, maybe in the way they go to market and, and, and conduct business, but it, it it it's not subtle when, when you do it that way. That's for sure, yeah. and um, it's potentially shows sign of weakness or vulnerability mm. within the organization. If if your HR department is calling executives at your competitors trying to recruit them, um, that, that you know, may, now maybe it's a sign of growth and prosperity, but maybe it's a sign of trouble on the home front. I mean, the way I look at it is if I call somebody and I'm able to convince that person to come over to this side, then something wasn't right over there to begin with. So what I tell people is make sure your employers are happy because somebody else might dangle and even an even prettier carrot. That's right. Well, and, and look, you and I, I think our agreement on this from the candidate's perspective, every candidate, every employee, other than those who have a contractual agreement that locks them into a period of time, you're kind of a free agent, right? Yep. I mean, for all intents and purposes, you are all the time on the market, right? Now, some people will say, I'm happy, not looking, and that's great. We want those candidates, but I'm convinced, and I always, I forever will be, and they'll prove it otherwise, that everyone will leave for something. Yeah, there, there is agree. a job that everyone will leave for. So I, even as the president and owner of, of of my company, you know, I always say if Bill Belichick calls and offers me the starting <laughs> role, I'm out. I'm I'm I'll be in I'll be in Boston tomorrow. Oh you know, man, will, you guys hear that? Pete's I'll, leaving to be a Patriot. Well, <laughs> a no, New England Patriot, not just a Patriot, but the starting quarterback for the Patriots. I mean, let's and let's then, be frank. And then so, your iPhone alarm goes off and God, I got to go to work. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So we don't, I don't anticipate that call coming. I've given up on it. Um, okay. However, right. the point being, we all have, yeah, there, we all have a dream job and if we're in it, great, but boy, I mean, you can always improve. So look, that's a conversation maybe for a different show, mm -hmm. but 
we know that proactive recruiting of, of gainfully, happily employed candidates is part of the executive search process. We know that. So that's, right. that's where the third party often comes in play. And, it, and I said I'd touch on it. So just briefly, when it comes to retained search, what we mean by that is engaging uh, an organization to conduct a search on your behalf where part, you, you essentially pay them part of the fee uh, at the inception of, of the search, right? To, to begin conducting the search. And the reason why you do that um, for a senior level role is because of the time that has to be invested in it. Mm -hmm. And so to initiate that search, it, it shows a, a, a deep commitment by the employer and a commitment by the third party recruiter, the headhunter, if you will, um, who's going to conduct that search uh, by having a, 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 a true partnership on that, not not loose contingency based uh, search where there's really no obligation or commitment on either side. Uh, the, the retained agreement takes that to a, a different level and is often a very appropriate and effective way to conduct an executive search. So I, I'm I'm with you 100 percent as well with, uh, with that piece. And the best way I can describe it, because what I'm thinking about is why 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 would you if if you could do it in house, why would you go outside? Here's the best way I can describe it. Over the weekend on Saturday, I was over at my in laws' house trying to fix a uh, a a light, trying to replace some light bulbs. And I can do that, right? I'm a recruiter. I can do that. I can fix these light bulbs. But as soon as the transformer that brings the electricity into the house goes away, I'm hiring a professional because I don't know the first thing about that. And I'm not going to spend hours on YouTube trying to be a certified electrician. And I don't want people to uh, come to my funeral saying, wow, he was dabbling in something he shouldn't have. <laughs> so you want to bring in an expert who's a, who's done this, who do this for a living. They are established in the in the industry, and they're able to bring this the, to 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 solve this problem for you in the most efficient way possible. So yeah, um, um, you have to draw that line and say, you know what, we can't do this. Let's bring somebody else in because, quite frankly, again, it is a different beast. And you know this to recruit for a uh, executive than it is for for a regular employee, just because of the effects they have on the organization. Co correct. So. Let's talk about that recruiting process yeah. a little bit more, yeah. right? So what, what happens? So whether you're doing it in-house or you engage a third party, the effort is relatively the same. Um, you know, the first thing you have to do is establish what, what your priorities are, what the expectations are for the role and for the search. Um, it's a different consideration if there's a, if it's a replacement. Maybe you, mm -hmm. you already have an existing uh, job description and, and detail, you know what the role entails fully. Perhaps you want to reconsider some, some making some changes, but that's that's the first step is fully understand the responsibilities of the role, who you're looking for, what they're going to be doing, um, and you know, get on the same page with anyone involved in the hiring and the recruiting process. That is to me a must. And and by the way, that applies to all recruiting efforts. You know, too often the person who or group that creates a job description is not the the, the same as the, uh, the the recruiter, and is not the same as the hiring manager, and is often not the same as the person who comes in at the end and makes the final approval. Right? It's I mean, me. what a mess! <laughs> you know, at, at times like that, and but yeah. that's pretty common, and. While you want to avoid that always, you certainly want to make sure you cover all of that up front with the executive's uh, search process, because the last thing you want to do is have a, a someone in a senior role realize that you are sloppy yeah. and unprepared in your recruiting effort. Uh, they will lose confidence very quickly, and you're going to lose great candidates through that. No, that's right. And, 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 and so what you need to to really think about from a recruiting perspective Right. It, it's well, actually no from a from a client's perspective, looking to hire an organization to do this is be meticulous, be really, really, really clear on who you're looking for. And that's easier. That's way easier to replace than it is to create a new position, because if you if you're replacing the JD is already done, job description is already there. You could just have a conversation with the people who work with this person. But if you're creating a position from scratch, that's a whole different monster, right? Because a client can say, 
dang it, you know what? I need somebody to help me, but they haven't really figured out how they can help. So you just got to sit down and just write. Look, at the end of the day, it's this. If you're the CEO trying to be, bring in a second in command, you got to sit down and write down all those things that you don't want you don't want to do as a CEO that you can farm off to somebody else as an executive so they can execute the strategies that you're putting in place. So that's a whole different monster. So Pete, my question to you is cuz I I believe you have some experience in that. How how do you how, what questions do you ask a client? What kind of questions should a client be ready for if they say, "Pete, I need a a second in command, but I don't have a job description." Well, you, you know, it's a long conversation, right? I mean, that would be its own podcast episode yeah. probably. But yeah. you 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 want to know a lot of things. You want to know what the person is going to be doing. Okay. You know, how success will be measured in the role, um, what their day to day is going to be like, what their span of control is, you know, what who their direct reports are. Um, yeah, so everything, you know, a lot of what, right? And then you need um, to, to look at the background that's needed for that and make sure you're on the same page, you know, with that. So uh, it's look look past and look forward, right? And and then you know understand how success will be measured in the role. That is a huge component of it. And then you really need to get deep with the who part of it. And that's mm -hmm. where you get into the soft skills, the leadership styles, the approach, um, the success and experience the person's had and where they had it, in the type of environment they were in, if they only been with small organizations and moving mm -hmm. to a big one or vice versa. We see that a lot with uh, uh, commercial uh, companies versus DOD companies. They don't necessarily translate at times. So you have to consider all of as many things as you can um, to paint the fullest picture that you possibly can and only then should you go forward in that search. And I'll say you know, one more time that that is really not different than a staff level role in a perfect world. There's just more depth to it when, when it's an executive position because you really want to cover every possible um, detail and know that, that if you cover 100 points, there's going to be mm -hmm. 101 that you haven't covered. So you have to be prepared for that too. We know that, Ricky, that you can never – really co cover everything up front. No, you, you can. And, and you know what? And and now that we're talking, because because you said it's somewhat similar to a staff, but when it comes to interviewing, I think that's a little bit different, right? Because if you interview somebody coming in and they're at the bottom, I, I hate to say it this way, at the bottom of the totem pole, right? They're at the beginning of their career. You're going to focus more on their skill set than anything else. Whereas the higher up you go in the chain of command that you're interviewing for. So for example, now you got a senior director, you got a VP, you got executives. You you as a recruiter are going to be less less focused on their skill set, their their technical skill set, but more focused on their influence. Because the higher up you go, the more influential you need to be because you've got to motivate people. Right. You let the people deal with the uh, with the uh, technical stuff, but you got to be able to resonate with them. You got to be able to motivate them. So you got to ask completely different questions. That's right. And that's where you get into, again, the, the, how they think, how they operate, yeah. their leadership style, where you're, you're not going to uh, be as focused on those things or, or even at all with staff level junior positions. Yep. So it, it really is about what you expect of the role. And, and making sure that the interviewing and screening is focused on those things as right. important as what's on their resume. If not, I mean, I guess more important is really the better way to phrase it um, uh, because you, you have to get to know the individual at, at, a, at a deep level. And right. so a lot of this is really what we're talking about is setting expect, expectations up front by all the people involved. I mean, that's been, it's very consistent as we talk about executive search and that then goes to once you define the role and who you're looking for, then it you need a you need a recruiting plan for it, and it, where you're going to find this person, how you're going to approach it, uh, those are their own um, considerations that that require some in-depth thought and consideration. And once again, making sure that everyone's on the same page. And, and and you don't just go about this blindly. You, <laughs> no. you take a very targeted approach to executive recruiting. 
And this is why it's crucial for all recruiters or leaders to just always network. I know people get tired of us talking about this, Pete, but always, always network. Because if you if you're working with an agency that has a wide network, that has solid relationships, you're going to end up betting a much better client, an easier process in getting that client than either doing it on your own or working for with an agency that just lollygags. So, yes, this is very crucial because you really want to make it. it it's you could tell when somebody's prepared when an agency is prepared they got all their stuff together by what kind of questions they ask and how because it's peep i've seen agencies that just here apply here let me get this and i'll find some, um, uh, somebody for you how we do it here is different we have conversations it's almost like we're you know what we're match.com there Pete. that's who we are we're trying to make people happy and match them together uh, what is it? E-harmony, the, the 12 different um, characteristics of getting people together. Do we have some of those? We got some characteristics. You know what, Ricky? I, I've been married for 26 years. I miss that. I miss those, that that whole boat. I'm not <laughs> sure right. um, how those I things work. Commercial. And so I, I don't know that I can buy off. Uh, I, I can sign off on the uh, <laughs> on the comparison. So I'll have, to take, I'll have to take a I'll have to take a pass on that. Roger that. Got um, it. but okay. So we've, you know, you establish, so there's a lot of work that has to be done yes. before you make the first phone call. Um, but, but then you go through it and, you know, you, you have to have a, a very well thought out strategy for then qualifying your candidate too, mm -hmm. and then knowing how to move them forward. So you don't want to make up this interview process, this screening and interviewing process as you go, you need to establish that very clearly up front communicate that timeline to the candidate. And that is something that uh, I recommend to every employer for every role that often gets looked past and ignored, which is communicate all of this up front to the candidate. Set yourself up for success. Why? Well, you if you if you have a fast time frame and the candidate assumes it's going to be longer, the timing may not work out and you could lose a great candidate. Yep. Similarly, if you have a lengthy process, as you often will with executive recruiting, you need to make sure the candidate knows so you don't want to get any surprises along the way. That's just 101 to me, but it's it's missed often. No, it, it I see that all the time too. That Pete, that's why I tell people you've got to be the GPS for the candidate. There's nothing worse than a candidate not knowing what to expect in the whole process. But if you, as the recruiter, can be the GPS for that person, let them know how them how many interviews are they going to do. What is the expected time frame for this to be complete? And what happens if you don't make it? What happens if you if you're not selected? What's the process for that? That sends a huge message to all parties involved, like, wow, this organization is prepared and they're professional. So that's the message you want to send. So I agree with you 100%. I'm really glad you brought that up because that is also an often overlooked part of the recruiting process, which is you're not going to hire all the candidates. So you that's need right. to give them the message, let them down. We've talked about a lot that a lot on the podcast, how mm -hmm. candidates should reply, or I'm sorry, uh, react in that situation. But- how the employer handles that situation is equally important. That's right. Um, because we we have to be willing to uh, take the time, especially with executives, to let them know you know why they're um, they're not going to be moving forward in the process or not selected. Um, because it's a round world. We know that things will come back, and just because you don't hire someone today doesn't mean they may not be a fit for a different position tomorrow. Uh, we know that too. So. I'm glad you brought that up. It's a key step in the in the process sure. for sure. Um, right. So then it comes to so let, let's talk about drawn out interview process just real quick. I just want to touch on that sixty seconds. Okay. Why do companies do that? Why do company? I just read an article yesterday that uh, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, maybe it was on LinkedIn that that was talking about how a candidate wasn't selected after nine interviews. First of all, nine. who the hell is doing nine <laughs> interviews and what's wrong with you, right? I mean, wow. that's inexcusable. It, you, you should be, you shouldn't be allowed to be involved in the hiring process if you, if you need nine interviews. What is the max number you think is acceptable to put a candidate through? Wow. On average, on average, it should take two, but no more than three. No more than three. 
Um, I've been employed by organizations who take six interviews. And my question to them is, what can you possibly find out on interview six that you couldn't get out of interview three? That's right. I mean, you're wasting everybody's time here, um, but they still wanted it that way. Um, I think two, three, the max, no more than three. Anything outside of that, somebody's doing something wrong in the process because how could you not make a decision by that point? Yeah, and if you if if for whatever reason you've decided you have to have a lot of people involved in, in the decision, then do, do it at once. Get get the candidate together. Yeah. Get them get them all in the same room. Get them all in the same Zoom if you're doing these some of these virtually. But don't don't put someone through that kind of time, and don't spend your own time and resources. Go back and figure out why you need it why you think you need it, and then reconsider. And you'll probably find out, to your point, you're asking the same things over and over again. Yeah. This is not a jury trial. It is an interview. Don't grill someone. Don't make. Um, don't waste time. Stop wasting so much nine time. That's ridiculous. Nine interviews yeah. on the uh, Wall Street Journal article? The person went through nine? Nine. I think it was on LinkedIn yesterday. I think that's where I saw it. Wow, yeah. that's insane. Uh, I'll, 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 I would have quit we'll by link seven. It, we'll link it in the show notes if we find it. If this yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, no, three, three should be the max. Anything above and beyond that, to me, is a red flag. Now, it, it's I get it. I get it from corporate America's side. You may have some other people who are prudent to this cop to this um um interview that may not have the time. So my my pushback is. Okay, how important is this for you? We don't want to lose this candidate. I would love for you to be involved in the in the in the interview panel early early enough, especially if this is a great candidate, because we don't want to call this candidate and say, "Hey, well, it, 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 congratulations, you made it to the next step. Here is your ninth interview." Now they say, "You know what? I'm I'm tired of this," and they'll leave. You're going to lose great candidates because the candidates with the awesome credentials you're going to want are not going to have the patience for that. You know who will have the patience for that? The candidates who nobody wants. That's right. That, that's exactly <laughs> it. That's, that's exactly what it. Happened. And they're going to harbor bad feelings about you for sure if they're not selected. And even if they are, they're, go they're going to grow skeptical of you along the way. I mean, that's, that's not, right. not going to probably make anyone feel better and more confident about your organization if you keep calling them back, I mean, it's, just, it's a bad idea. But if you insist on doing that and, and you, you you think that nine or, are necessary or even four or five, be sure to communicate that up front, set the expectation. That's a, that's the most important thing. Um, and then go back. Yeah, give and give the candidate process. the opportunity to eject themselves before you start. Interviewing. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So you extend the offer. Every, every organization has their own way of doing that. And then um, you announce it to your team. And that is that is uh, something to be celebrated and, and done consciously with, with uh, mm -hmm. foresight. When you're bringing on an executive, you want to set that person up, up for success to be brought in the best possible way, depending on the situation. It may shake up some things within the organization. It often does. Uh, any tips that or thoughts that you have on on announcing a new executive hire? I do. There's two different types of announcement, right? Because if you're replacing someone, not not now remember, we're not talking I just an average employee. We're talking about somebody, a VIP per se, who has a lot of visibility and will have a lot of impact in the organization. So how you deliver this message is crucial. Especially if you're a publicly traded company. You, if you mess up the communication to the employees, if you do it wrong, if you make a mistake, you could send some vibes out there to Wall Street about instability and leadership. So you got to be careful with that. You, it's so number one, if you are replacing somebody, let's make sure we talk about the exit story of one person, wishing them well, and and including this new person and how the organization is going to change. It's got to be positive. The second one is if this is a brand new position, you might want to st st start talking about the exciting news of adding this new person to this new role that's going to make our world just that much better. You've got to be able to have a positive tone to it. I'm not going to say spin, but positive tone to it so people can welcome this person with open arms, especially somebody high up there. I love Thoughts it. On that? I, yeah. yeah, I think I think that's yeah. perfect, Ricky. And yeah. that's a, that's a great way to to wrap this up. Um, that's right. In in all of this, I think if there's a theme, to what we've talked about, think through everything in advance, from beginning to end, from the time you are defining who and what this person is going to be doing, 
of all the way through the announcement. If you do that, you're setting yourself up for a successful executive search process. And when you need help, ask for it. Four Corner Resources is, is, is always available. And if we're not the right fit for you, we'll, we'll point you in the right direction and tell you who, who is. Because look, I mean, we don't want to take on jobs that we're not a good fit for either. And depending sure. on the industry and, and, the, and the role, there, there may be someone who uh, um, is better qualified not in how they go about recruiting, of course, I would never say that, but in that particular niche. So ask for help if you need it. Executive sure. uh, positions, just like any recruiting, is is not easy. It it requires its own special skills and, and experience. So um, don't hesitate to reach out if we can help guide you in the right direction. Otherwise, that's right. Ricky, that's all I have for today. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Pete. I hope you have an awesome week because I know I, I will. I hope you do too, ending in <laughs> Barcelona uh, before we are live again or, or recording again. So look forward to hearing all about it next time, Ricky. Thanks so much. Have a good one, folks. Drive safe. Good night.